representing the United States of America. Do you remember our collective shock when we found out how much Michael Phelps, the famous Olympian, ate every day during training? He was eating eight to 10,000 calories a day. When we're trying to be at our best, we want to be at race weight at all times. So I'm forcing myself to eat. I don't like to eat now. Reminder, humans on average should consume about 2,000 calories a day, not eight to 10,000. His diet became a moment. So much so that Saturday Night Live even spoofed it back in the day. In the sketch, Michael's touting a new diet, the Michael Phelps diet, to show you how you can eat everything and somehow get a ripped body like Phelps. Hungry for a delicious, nutritious breakfast? I sure am. Well, how about three fried egg sandwiches, a, cha- a stack of chocolate chip pancakes, a bowl of grips, a five egg omelet, French toast with powdered sugar, and a gallon of coffee? ice cream. Wow! For an athlete at Phelps' level, that's what it took for his body to be fully fueled. But what about those of us who are not Olympians? One of the most important things to focus on is protein. What we're looking at is somewhere between 20 to 30 grams of protein. And that's not enormous. Again, size of smartphone is what we're looking at. That's Leslie Bonsi, whose job it was to feed the Kansas City Chiefs, this year's Super Bowl winners. She joins us on this week's podcast, to break down protein for us mere mortals, how much protein we need, and what kind of proteins should we eat to maintain a strong, healthy body. So how can you stay fully fueled? This is Body Unboxed, and I'm your host, Anahat O'Connor. I'm here with our resident nutrition expert, Professor Joan Salji Blake, the author of Pearson's leading textbook titled Nutrition and You. Joan, welcome. Thank you, Anahat. Happy to be back with you. This week, we're talking about something very practical, something that might even change the way you think about eating every single day. We're talking about protein consumption and exercise. We're asking our experts, how can we fuel our bodies in order to maximize our workouts and optimize our health. You got it, Anahad. I mean, it's hard enough getting to the gym or making that workout fit into your busy day. So we really wanna make sure that we're fueling our bodies in order to maximize that workout session. That's right, and this stuff is really scientific. It's not just about eating trends. We're talking about exactly how many grams of protein we need to eat on a daily basis in order to not only build muscle, which we think about all the time when we talk about protein, but also our joints, our ligaments, and even our bones. So, Joan, I'm a pretty big gym guy. I used to lift weights at least four or five days a week, and my workout was never really complete without a protein shake at the end. I would go to the store and buy whey protein and all kinds of protein powders, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who bought into the marketing hype or you know, wondered whether I was doing the right thing. What we're going to learn from this episode is what you should be eating when you're lifting those weights. It's very important to look at the type of protein, but also the timing. So maybe that protein shake would have been better if you did it before you lifted those weights. Ah, if only I'd known. Exactly. There are complex biological processes at play here. And I had to get to the expert to help break it down for all of us. Leslie Bonsi is a sports dietitian, and she has consulted for multiple professional teams. Right now, she's consulting with the NFL Kansas City Chiefs. She's pretty much the superstar dietitian of the moment since she was part of the team that fueled the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. Hashtag, it takes a village. Leslie, thank you for coming on. I am thrilled to be here. All right. (laughs) So this is such a hot, hot topic about, you know, protein. And and so many people think if I eat more protein, I'm going to have this major muscle mass. I'm going to be bulking up. So first of all, just explain to everybody here, you know, what is the role that protein plays in building muscle mass? So, you know, we're really looking at as if you were creating a house, right? You you just don't erect the outside of the house. You have to start with 
uh, the foundation and then the drywall. And truly, when we think about the body, we think, oh, protein equals muscle. That's true. However, it is part of every cell in the body. Mm -hmm. Yes, protein is a component of hormones. Protein is a component of antibodies. Protein is a component of ligament and joints and tendons and muscle and also bone. And people forget about that. So truly, if we want the body to be nourished, this is why it is what we call an essential macronutrient. We have to be on the protein with our protein. Oh, very clever. Now, during the day, you know, we were always one of thinking about muscle synthesis, but but isn't it true that during the day we're breaking down muscle? So over the course of the day, if we were just in build mode all the time, we would all look like tree trunks and nobody <laughs> would get around. I mean, it's just impossible. You know, there are the up and down or the roller coaster that happens. So we have times during the day when we are in protein synthesis or build mode, and that typically might happen if somebody's doing strength training and when you're eating food with protein. However, we have periods of time when we fast and that's when we break down or when we're working out very hard with cardio endurance activity, we break down. But at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. The goal is that we want protein synthesis to exceed protein breakdown. That is what we are aiming for over the course of 24 hours, not every single hour of the day. Right. And you know, Leslie, when you say fasting, people think, oh, I'm fasting for, you know, 12 hours, two days. Fasting in between meals, right? So during the day when you're, that that's the kind of fasting, right? Now. Yeah. So we say that is right. So, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm going to go eight to 10 hours without eating. But if you do that, then you have those eight to 10 hours that your body is in breakdown. And that's why it is the distribution of protein that is very, very critical, not just how much protein we eat, how we eat that protein over the course of the day. You know, that's so, so important because, you know, most of many of us eat like a triangle, you know, as the day goes on, our calories increase. And what happens is we, we're not really very robust in our protein intake during the day. And then comes dinner like, whoa, bring out the rotisserie chicken. And that doesn't really do you any good, right? Because you want to just dis disperse that chicken over the day. Like maybe you want to have the leg in the morning and the breast at lunch and the thigh someplace else. So you really shouldn't be going all day long with very little skimpy protein and eating more at night, correct? Absolutely. So one of the things that people do is minimal protein and then just eat a whole fowl at night. And no, that is not what we are talking about. And this is also the concern when people say, oh, I'm focusing on my macros. No, it isn't that. It's not just number of grams of protein. It's not just percent. Is Are you having some as part of every meal? So to your point, yes, maybe it's the neck and the wing in the morning. Maybe we're doing that breast at lunch and then a little thigh at dinner. You know. So we're dividing the body parts out over the course of the day. <laughs> and when you divide those up, we all know that there is an important amino acid that really is very important for muscle mass and that's leucine. So can you tell us a little bit about that? When we think about protein and what is protein composed of, it is composed of amino acids or basically the building block of protein. However, you have to have them all for the body to be able to synthesize new protein. So if somebody said, I'm only going to have lysine or I'm only going to have methionine, that's not going to work. We really need them all. But when we're looking specifically at protein synthesis, it is leucine, L-E-U-C-I-N-E. -E. That is the one that really is the driver of muscle protein synthesis. So that means that over the course of the day, every time we're eating food with protein, we need to have adequate amounts of leucine. And so this becomes an issue for people that are planning plant-based, for people that are vegan, that are not consuming any animal source foods because plant-based foods do have leucine in much lower amount, which means that you have to eat more of them mm -hmm. to get the amount of leucine that the body needs, which basically is about 2.15, to be precise, grams of leucine per meal is really what the body's looking for. But that means you have to consume 20 to 30 grams of protein total to get that 2.15 grams of leucine. And so you said animal products are good sources of leucine. Any particular that you love? Yes. So when we look at the the animal source foods that are highest in terms of leucine, kind of at the top of the list would be whey. So you know, whey is one of the proteins in milk. And then beef, 
is very, very high in terms of leucine. Chicken and fish have a little bit less, but they all have some. Eggs as well will have some leucine in them. And you know, the nice thing is it's not a huge amount. You don't have to eat the whole rotisserie chicken <laughs> to get the two grams of leucine. It's probably the equivalent of three to four ounces, right? The size of our smartphone. That's right. it. Not right. anything enormous is what we're looking for. Okay. What about when you're working out? Do you need to eat protein right before you work out? Should you eat it during the workout or after? What uh, timing you said during the day, but there is a timing issue when you're working out, right? So when we're looking at exercise, one of the things that I say to my athletes all the time, they never listen. This is why I repeat things constantly. But, you know, you're either in a state of prepare, repair. You're preparing for the workout you're going to do, and you're repairing from the workout you just did so you can do it again. And so when we think about the things that are critical for that, and let's look specifically at strength training, resistance training, Mm -hmm. that type of activity, is you want to have a little bit of protein, not just after, but before. And that's Mm -hmm. not what most people do. Most people will wait until after and then consume a vat of something, not necessary overkill. So kind of splitting that to have some protein pre and post really helps your body to better have anabolism or that building effect that we're looking at instead of the catabolism, which is the breakdown. Interestingly as well, is that when people do more cardio type of activity, oh, I'm going for a run or a bicycle ride. I don't need to think about protein. Well, yes, you do because your body is breaking down when you're doing that activity. So you want to replace on the back end. And so with that type of activity, we're really wanting to have some protein as part of the conclusion, as part of the repair, not just about the carbs. Why something like Milk works really well. Or people use chocolate milk. Why? It's not just about the chocolate as much as we love that. It's about the milk that provides the protein. Right, right. You know, and that, that's why I'm so glad you said that because really when people say I'm going to go to the gym, I'll grab a banana so I can fuel my workout. But what you're saying is maybe a little bit of peanut butter on the banana. You know what I mean? You get some protein in there to help you uh, fuel it before and after. And isn't it true, Liz, that after you're working out, like don't wait too long before you have that protein? Like, shouldn't it be pretty close to the time you finish working out? Well, one of the things that in the more recent studies has shown that the body can actually take advantage of that anabolism over several hours, not just in the immediate period of time. That being said, however, is... You know, a lot of time people wait as, oh, I'm going to text 5,000 people. I'm going to do whatever. And then by the time you do eat, it is a little bit of a missed opportunity. So what we're talking about here is a post-activity snack, not a feast. It doesn't have to be that. So something on the small side, some people opt to use a bar. Some people might do something like, you know, a, a glass of milk. You know, some people may do some peanut butter on their banana. It doesn't have to be enormous, but ideally something to seal the deal and then the next time you eat is another opportunity to replenish and restore and refresh and renew with a little bit more protein as part of that subsequent meal. But you know, Les, I hate to say this, but you're right. So that you know some <laughs> things that you, the milk, look at me, I'm a shopper, you know, that's how I love getting two for the price of one. So if having the milk afterwards, I got the protein, I got the leucine, and I've got fluid hydration. Was that three for the price of one? What do you think? Three or four for the price of run, because even if you do a flavored milk, then you'll have some additional carbohydrate. And that really is part of that recovery. So there we go. Oh, there exactly. we go. Bingo. We just won the lottery with that. That's good. That's great. So you talk about good quality protein. You talk about protein every meal. We're laughing about, you know, have the breast in the morning and the, and the wing at, you know, for a snack or whatever. Seriously, how many grams of protein do we have to have at each meal to make it work? So what we're looking at is somewhere between 20 to 30 grams of protein. And that's not enormous. Again, size of smartphone is what we're mm-hmm. looking at, mm-hmm. right? This is not the whole chicken at any point in time. Mm-hmm. That could be the equivalent of three eggs. That could be something like a Greek yogurt, a serving of Greek yogurt that might have perhaps like a higher protein cereal added to it. So it's not that large of a quantity, number one, in terms of those animal source protein. And secondly, we get protein in vegetable. There is protein Mm -hmm. in grain. So when you're having a mixed plate, you're getting protein from pretty much everything on the plate with the exception of fruit or sweets or oil. Everything else is a source of protein. Now, that being said, if somebody says, I'm going to go plant-based, I don't want to eat something with a face, it's like, okay, fine. So if you're going to do it with beans, then you are going to have to have more. And that is because 
plant source proteins also have significant carbohydrate and fiber. They're Mm -hmm. not just the source of protein itself. And so we have to bring that volume up. So it's not, oh, I sprinkled four chickpeas, one, two, three, four on my salad and did it. No, you didn't. It's probably like one cup at least of chickpeas as part of that salad to to get what the body needs and maybe mixing that with some rice and the vegetables. And now you're up to that 20 grams of protein we're looking for. Or soy, right? The leucine in soy. Soy is actually very, very high. And so things like tofu, things like veggie burgers that are soy based, uh, things like edamame, which is an easy, easy add in to a salad. If somebody says, I want to be more plant based and value added, you get some extra fiber with that, that you are not going to get an animal source protein. Okay. Now you guys tell me this. Have you ever, because I can't imagine, I mean, I football players are very large people and they eat a lot. Have you ever had a vegetarian, like football player? Like, how did you do that? Yes, actually several. We've had several vegan players. And let me tell you that when you are six foot eight and 280 pounds of basically chiseled is that's a heck of a lot of beans. It's a lot of beans. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it's a lot of veggie burgers. It's a lot of tofu. It's a lot of nuts. And it has to be a lot of calories because they're burning significant calories over the course of the day. Really advocates for using soy mm. because soy is comparable in terms of its amino acid profile to animal source protein. Mm -hmm. So a soy milk, not necessarily another plant-based juice, Uh, using the tofu added to something. We do a lot of nuggets that use tofu as a base because the protein content is very high and they're really quite versatile, sneaking those edamame into things and sometimes using a soy protein isolate. All of that is critically important to bring up that protein to the level it needs to be to support that behemoth body. (laughs) You know, what you just said is a great reminder, Leslie, because, you know, you said soy and you said not other plant-based milks or beverages because not other, I mean, soy, when you look at the dietary guidelines for Americans, only soy was was named as the alternative, the vegetarian alternative for, for a dairy milk because of all of the complete protein and all the other wonderful things that that's in soy milk. You know, if you start doing some of these other plant-baked oat milk or, you know, pea milk or whatever, it may not have the amount of protein that, and so you're really drinking something or maybe like post-exercise, you're drinking something, but you may be not getting that robust amount of protein. Well, and this is this is the issue. It's not that in and of itself there's anything wrong with having the pl- other plant-based yeah. beverages. It's fine. But it's not a one-for-one replacement. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, when I work with my athletes, you kind of have one shot to do it right. There really aren't too many opportunities for do-over from the eating perspective. So, you know, if you are going to use something, some other plant-based beverage, what are you going to add to right. it that's going to give you enough protein in that particular eating occasion? All right. So give us an idea because you're saying 20 to 30 grams of protein and just kind of give us, let's go through the day. What would like a protein, wonderful breakfast, lunch, maybe a snack and then a dinner be? Okay. So at breakfast time, if we wanted to do something like two eggs, so that's not a big volume. So two eggs and maybe add like a little bit of shredded cheese to it. That's going to give us probably 20 right there. I'm going to go a little bit more and say we could put a little spinach, maybe a little mushroom in there, and that might bring it up a couple more grams of protein and do that on a whole grain bread or in a pita or something along those lines. We probably have a good 30 right there at that meal. Right. And those eggs are a good source of that leucine, right? Eggs are, they, they do have a significant amount of leucine in them and and a whole egg, so not just the white, right. the whole egg is seven grams. So right there between the two, that's 14. You add the cheese and now we're up to 21 and a very, very easy thing to do. You can even make the eggs the night before or bake them like little egg cups. Those types of things work beautifully. At lunchtime, we have them always about getting vegetables into people. So if they, all right, I want to start with a salad, but if you're using salad as a base, so let's do a chipotle type of of salad. So maybe I have some greens on there. I've added some black beans onto that salad to add some protein. I'm adding a little bit of corn with a little bit of protein as well as the carbohydrate that's there. I might throw in a little bit of rice and then doing something very simply. Oh, 
some canned chicken. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Or even a little canned tuna if you want to do it this way. This is minimal effort, no cooking involved. And that kind of a thing, those little cans of three ounce can of, of chicken or tuna or the pouch is going to give you about 20 right there. With the beans, we're probably 27, even close to 30 grams of protein in that meal. As a snack item, what could we do? How about something like what a little five ounce Greek yogurt and put some cereal on it? Mm -hmm. That's probably going to get us somewhere around 15, or we do the savory option of that, a plain Greek yogurt mixed with some kind of a seasoning like a ranch dressing mix or a buffalo dip mix, and then having that with some vegetables that's probably going to give us a good 15, 20 grams of protein. And then at dinner time, how about doing a stir fry? Mm -hmm. And we might take that chicken breast or that chicken thigh and we slice it up and we put it in the stir fry and we're adding a good two cups of vegetables and maybe serving that over a noodle. And we've got it right there in terms of what the body needs without having significant amount of protein just at one time of the day. We've divided it evenly over the course of the day. Okay, now, what about before you go to bed? Because you just went through this whole fasting thing. And, you know, if you're hopefully sleeping at least eight hours, should you, before you go to bed, have a snack, a protein-rich snack? There are a lot of research studies that have looked at shortening that time from when we had dinner to when we'll eat in the morning, that if you have something before bed, meaning probably 60 to 90 minutes, not five minutes before you're going to go to sleep, that indeed you might do a better job in terms of muscle protein synthesis, restore, replete while you sleep. So a lot of people use smoothies and things like that during the day as a meal replacement. Well, that's fine, except that five minutes later, you're ready to eat your arm because you didn't chew anything. So why not think about something like that before bed? It's lighter. It'll leave the stomach faster. It's one-stop chopping in terms of getting in what your body needs. So ending the day, you could use Soy milk is a base, add some milk. We could blend that cottage kind of cheese. Actually, it does blend and puree and add you know a little bit of liquid to that, throw in some fruit. It feels nice and light and it's helping the body to restore optimally while we sleep. That's great. Why, Leslie, a 60 to 90 minutes before you go to bed versus right before you get? You want to digest, I assume, or what? Well, and the reason for this is that you know, when your body is ready to have a siesta, you really don't want to be having a fiesta. <laughs> hey, look at this. I've got all this food in my gut, and then you're not sleeping. So, you know, really giving the body time to digest means typically at least an hour is we want the food out of the stomach so that when you're lying down, you can actually sleep better because we know with sleep is a critical part of restoration. It's not just about what you eat before you go to bed. Or to bed. That's right, because if you don't get good sleep, you're not going to be able to get up the next day and have a great day and do some exercise and um, build your muscle mass there. Um, I love that. You know, So basically, you want to eat something, but you don't want everything partying in the stomach while you're trying to lay down and go to sleep. Yeah, I get it. Okay. I think what's really important that, you know, spreading it out, the quality, getting in that leucine, getting everything to work together and exercising. I mean, you know, I'm not going to get killer abs if I or if I don't go to the gym and do something, right? Yeah, you know, if this activity is critically important and the lifting that goes along with it, it's not either or, they're not mutually exclusive. So Leslie, if you say, okay, you got to get protein in your diet, it's really important. What would be like the take home message? You know what? To me, I always think about this for my athlete to support your supporting structure. Mm. You have to nourish your body to be able to be at the best each and every day. I've never, ever had an athlete that said to me, I want to be the weakest. I want to be the slowest. I want to fatigue before I start. And that's why protein is so critically important. We can't do it without. It's not protein to the exclusion of all else, but it definitely need to be there as a priority each and every time we eat to optimize performance, to optimize physique, to end for optimizing our health. Right. And you know, it, it's a team sport. So ready? So you got to have all the nutrients working together, right? Team sport to, to, to working at your optimal. So you just can't have a rotisserie chicken with no vegetables and grains or dairy at the meal. It's, it's a team effort. So there you go. So absolutely, you know, creating a performance plate, that's not an N of one. There's lots of things that need to be on that plate. And that's the template we're looking at over the course of the day. Dr. Joan, even as a fitness guy, I learned a lot from that interview. So thanks to Leslie Bonsi, we understand how much protein we need in our day-to-day -day lives. But as we learned with Michael Phelps, this doesn't affect everyone equally. For example, 
What does protein intake look like for older adults, Dr. Joan? You are right about one thing, or many things. Older adults need to really focus on their protein intake as they age to make sure they're keeping those bones and muscles strong. I wanted to learn more about this, so I called up on our next guest, the fabulous Chris Rosenblum. Chris is a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in food and exercise for older people. She actually co-authored the book, Food and Fitness After 50, so she She has so much wisdom to share with us. I first asked her to talk about how muscle mass and strength declines with age. I mean, everything slows down a bit when we age. It's just a natural part of life. But that doesn't mean that you can't build muscle and you can't maintain muscle as you get older. It just means you might have to work a little bit harder at it. And I think sometimes with aging, it's really hard to untangle what we consider usual aging from disuse. So, you know, when people aren't using their muscles, you know, we always talk about use it or lose it. And that's mm-hmm. really true when it comes to muscle mass. And that loss probably starts in our 40s. So it's It's not like this is something we wake up with at 65. It's something that was gradual. So by continuing to use and challenge our muscles and feed our muscles, we should be in pretty good shape. You talk about, you know, it used to be that, you know, 40 is a new 30. Now, like 70 is a new 40. And so it's so interesting. Yeah, sarcopenia literally means vanishing flesh. So Mm -hmm. you're starting to lose your muscle mass. And there's actually another term that you might not have heard of, but it's dynapenia, which is just Mm -hmm. that gradual loss of muscle strength. So Mm -hmm. as we get older, you can lose not only muscle mass, but loss of strength and power. So those are both things that we want to keep because we want to be able to what I call functional fitness. You know, I'm not going to go out and hike the entire Appalachian Trail. I'm 71, but I am going to stay functionally fit. And my two things for functional fitness as I get older are one, I want to lift my own suitcase in the overhead bin. And I want to pick up a 50 pound bag of dog food so I can feed my big dog. And I want to continue to garden. I love gardening and I'm working our botanical gardens. That's a lot of bending and stooping and pulling. And those are things that are important to me as I get older. So I'm not looking to be a bodybuilder. I'm just looking to keep what I have so that I can be functionally fit. So what is the best exercise that we should be looking at so that we can hold on to this? You know, I think there are three types of exercise that you want to do. Obviously, you want to continue with endurance exercise to keep up the aerobic strength. You know, you've got, you've got to get the oxygen to the muscles. You've got to have a strong heart and lungs to get that oxygen there. Mm-hmm. So you still want to keep up aerobic exercise. But then you want to think about that strength training piece, which is one thing that a lot of people don't do, or they do one or the other. So you need to do some progressive resistance exercise. And that doesn't mean going to the gym and using the machines. It can, but it doesn't have to be. You could also use your own body weight, push-ups and pull-ups and you know all those kinds of things that you could just do on the floor of exercise. But I also think the uh, resistance bands are really a good way to uh, build strength because they come in different gauges, you know, you got the very light to the heavy to the moderate, and you can use those and and they come with a series of exercises. So super easy thing to do. And seriously, just 10 to 15 minutes a day of those kind of strength training exercises, work your upper body, then the next day do the lower body. Doing that two or three times a week, you're going to be able to hold on to your muscle mass and actually build muscle. You know, Chris, I am guilty as charged because I walk like, you know, five to seven miles a day. I can walk to China and back every day. But but weight resistance, I am the worst. I am the worst. And I got those bands that you just suggested. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to open up the pack. I got them like two years ago. (laughs) Can I just open the pack up and use them? Because I thought maybe some way just ordering them may help me build muscle mass. (laughs) But I physically have to use them. Okay, I'm going to do that. Now that you shamed me into that, I'm going to do that. But also, I do the exercise and talk about how protein is important, especially as we age. Yeah, and and I think protein is more important as we age because Mm -hmm. our bodies don't handle the protein as well. There's something that's called the anabolic resistance of muscle as we age, meaning that the signals to build muscle aren't as strong. So by increasing the amount of protein that you eat throughout the day, and I also stress throughout the day, we don't want to just you know have coffee and a a croissant for breakfast and then backload all of our protein at dinner. We want to have probably about 30 grams of protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's hard for a lot of people. Um, The other thing I think that's challenging about that, and I know I see this with my friends who are 
older. They're so concerned about calories. They know I'm, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm not, I don't have the same body that I had when I was 25. It's like, well, of course you don't because you're 70. You're not going to have the same body. But I tell them to really choose those nutrient rich foods and not skimp on the calories, but just make sure every calorie counts by having good sources of protein, vitamins, and minerals within that, but not all this dieting all the time when you're older. That's going to really impact your muscles and your bones. Right. What are some nutrition and fitness challenges for older people? Because, you know, mother nature is just not nice, Chris. I mean, you finally get older, you finally have the time to do things. And then, you know, we have challenges. So what are some of those yeah. challenges? Well, you know, I, I tend to look at it when people say things like that to me that, you know, not everyone gets the privilege to get old. So I think we have to kind of take our mindset in a different direction and think, mm. you know, we're still here. Uh, a lot of our family members and parents and friends didn't get here. So I, I always try to be positive about it. But there are more challenges. You know, we ha can have more health problems. You know, even the best of us can have uh, heart disease or high cholesterol or hypertension um, or diabetes. But, you know, that doesn't mean that it's too late to do anything about that. So that's one of my mottos with people. It's never too late to start eating well or moving well. So just making those small little changes. You know, one of the things we talk about a lot with activity is activity snacks. You know, so so throughout the day, you know, get up off of your butt. And, and if you're sitting at the computer all day or you're watching TV and, you know, get up and walk up and down the stairs. If you have stairs in your home, uh, that exercise band looped around the doorknob so that you see it. I keep a five and 10 pound weight by my desk so that when I'm on a call, I can do a few bicep curls. It's just that visual reminder to do it. So it can be challenging. Some people also can have Things like arthritis, but there are so many great chair exercises that you can do. The Arthritis Foundation has a wonderful series that you can do online. So there are challenges, but they, they can be overcome. They can be overcome. And if somebody wanted some, some advice because they have medical issues or arthritis, as you said, where, where can you go to get advice as far as the best exercise based upon your age and your medical history and what's going on? You know, I think if you can uh, find a personal trainer, one who is uh, like certified by like the American Council on Exercise, you know, a, a real certification uh, trainer, because they're going to help you. They're going to know what uh, exercises are good. I've been seeing a personal trainer for the last year because I have a lot of shoulder issues and I don't want to have surgery. And I tease her that she could be a physical therapist. I mean, she really has a lot of knowledge about what I can and can't do and how I can strengthen all of the other muscles. Um, I think another great place to look is at the YMCA, you know, a lot of the Ys have classes designed for older adults and their trainers are very familiar with some of those problems and challenges. So I think that there may be things right outside your door that you're not even thinking about or, or uh, considering as a way to get active. And then, you know, just as normal things, I'd say find a buddy, you know, look in your neighborhood and see if somebody else is walking, you know, like you're walking. Is there somebody else that you can walk with? You're more accountable when you're actually got to meet somebody out front by the mailbox at a certain time to go walk. And then the last thing I'd say in terms of exercise is get a dog. And if you don't have a dog, volunteer at the shelter. They're always looking for volunteers to want to walk dogs. Just be careful. You might bring one home. <laughs> yeah, or two. You wrote an article. This was wonderful. And you talked about some themes. What you just said before, it's never too late to start exercising. And in this article, you said in 2016, Ida Keeling at 100 years old, broke the 80 years and older world record for the 100-yard dash at the Penn Relays, and she didn't start exercising until she was 67. Yes. And she's an amazing story. I have to give you a little update. Um, she died in 2021, but she was 106 when she died. <gasps> she was still active and breaking records up until she was 105 years old. And, you know, she didn't start exercising. And the reason she started is her daughter said, you know, mom, you need to get out of the house. You need to start doing something. And there are so many of these wonderful little competitions from everywhere from senior Olympics to local little competitions where they have age graded exercise. So you're not competing with a 20 year old. So right. I think she's a fabulous example. And then, you know, there's even people that people might know, like Diana Nyad, she swam from Cuba to the U.S. at the age of 64, and she had had two failed attempts before that. So, you know, it's that never give up. And there's so many inspiring people like that that are competing in 
everything from that kind of intense swimming to these uh, wonderful little activities in their community. That's so great. It, you know, again, you know, I was an athlete growing up and, you know, now I have grandkids or whatever. Go ahead, do yeah. it. If, if, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And now we have so much great nutrition and exercise science to back it up. And, and your yeah. book is an excellent way for people to get that information. It's Food and Fitness After 50. And boy, thank you so much for coming on here today day and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure. Dr. Joan, it's so interesting to hear how this all plays out for older adults. I learned so much. What were your takeaways from that chat? What is so important that, again, this is evolving science, and as you grow older, you still want to stay strong. You know, and if you want to hear more about the emerging science about protein and exercise needs for older people, Chris has a blog. It's called Fit to Eat, and she covers everything all about nutrition and exercise for older adults. So it's a great resource. Log on and, and you know, keep up to date with what she has to say. Our special bonus content will also address a lot of the science behind what we talked about in this episode. Make sure you check that out. We've heard from a number of experts, and we hope you found these conversations both educational and entertaining. Remember, we're not providing you individual medical advice, so take your family's medical questions to your doctor, especially before starting any new diet or health routine. And for medical emergencies, contact emergency services. Thank you so much for joining us on Body Unboxed by Pearson. Body Unboxed is produced by Neon Hum Media. Our lead producer is Alexandra De Palma. The executive producer is Sharon Morris.